Hello everyone, uh, we shall start sharp in next two minutes. Thank you for joining in. Hello everyone. Before I start, I just uh, anybody can let me know if I am loud and clear, audible to everyone. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Very much. Thank, you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. So hello all. A very good afternoon. Myself Ekta, and on behalf of the Brenalytics team and our presenting partner Indigen, we welcome you all and thank you for being part of webinar Pharma Tech Talks: Avenues to Digital Eminence. So before we start a webinar, I would quickly like to highlight some guidelines and make you people aware of, requesting all the attendees to be on mute when the speakers are taking their respective sessions. There would be a Q&A after each session where the attendees can ask the questions, if any, to their respective speakers. The guidelines are, you need to raise your hands, unmute yourself on your video, introduce yourself, and put your question to the concerned speaker. So to start with today, First, I would like to introduce our presenting partner, Indigene. It combines deep industry expertise with fit-for-purpose technology in an agile and scalable operating model. Many of the leading global healthcare organizations rely on its team to deliver effective and efficient clinical, medical, and commercial outcomes every day, from strategy to execution. And here we have Indigene who enables healthcare organizations to be future ready. And we are going to have some experts who are going to share their expert insights on the same. So a little about webinar, why we all are here today and what the webinar is going to focus on. We all know the world as we know today is being revolutionized by technology every passing minute. In the coming time, technology will drive the most value in the pharmaceutical industry and guide companies to build a strategy for success. This webinar focuses on the digital transformation, the need to accelerate technology and the potential benefits and efficiencies it brings along with it. We will also understand how pharmaceutical industry is being impacted by these innovations in technology. We have some wonderful thought leaders who are going to throw some interesting insights on the same. So now to begin our first session, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Atul Suri. To speak about him, Atul Suri is a strategic business unit head, leading six business divisions across cardiac, anti-diabetic and gynecology therapy areas at Alembic Pharmaceuticals Limited. Having served in an Indian army for over 25 years before joining the corporate world, Atul banks upon his vast and rich operational military experience in charting strategies and ensuring effective execution. And he is here with us today to share his insights on changing dynamic of the Indian pharmaceutical industry from an expert lens. So over to you, Mr. Atul, to start your session. Thank you for being here. Wonderful. Yeah, just give me a moment. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you ever so much uh, <clears throat> for that very warm welcome and introduction. I hope I can be heard clearly. Yes, you can. All right. Let me first start with, uh, you know, refuting a point that Ekta had said uh, that here's an expert. I don't purport to be an expert at all. Uh, but yes, I do have a huge amount of visibility of what's happening in our industry, the pharma industry. Having been closely associated uh, at the apex level for over six years now, and uh, I wouldn't even call it a ringside view. I wouldn't even call it a helicopter view. I'll probably coin a new term and call it a drone view because a drone today has the capacity to go wherever it wants to and zoom straight into and see something really deeply, closely with great amount of focus. So I've been fortunate to have a drone like uh, you know experience here at Olympic over the last six years. However, I don't qualify to be an expert at all. What has happened to me over the last so many years is I've attended various programs. You know, I did my master's in strategy uh, way back in 2004, followed by maybe a master's in management in 2014. Very recently, about four or five years back, uh, I did a course from the XLRI. Uh, and the only thing that I learned there is if someone has to take you a little seriously, either you start talking about, you know, a four box grid or a nine box grid, or you come up with, you know, some acronyms like eight P's and 12 D's or something. So in line with that, uh, you know, because I need to be taken seriously, I have come up with something to address the topic today of changing dynamics in our industry with 15 C's. So let's, let's go through that journey of 15 C's. And I promise to finish in the 20 minutes that have been given to me. So let me just share my screen. Just a moment. Yeah. Can my screen be is visible right now? Yes, yes, yes. Is the presentation coming up? Yes, it is. Yes, we can see. Let me just get hold of my little laser pointer. That's my toolkit, survival toolkit. Yeah. So can you see my laser pointer, all of you? Yes. Okay. So, well, the topic today is, of course, uh, pharma tech talks, avenues to digital eminence. Uh, and of course, I've been nominated uh, to give the keynote. And so you obviously want to ask me, why did I choose the famous alphabet C? Uh, it's all in the topic. Dynamics is all about change. And therefore, I have chosen the letter C. And as we move ahead in this presentation, you will soon realize which is the biggest change agent today, which has created such a dynamic thing. And that obviously is another C, which you can all recognize over here which is the coronavirus. People have been calling it a pandemic. However, in so far as India is concerned, while it is still a pandemic, and I won't argue with that, what it definitely has become today due to the healthcare infrastructure in the country or the way it's been managed is nothing short of a catastrophe. So that's the other C that I have for you. So from all of this, let's see, how is all of this going to impact our industry, the pharma industry? The most important thing you will all agree with me is capital. Let's see what capital has in store in terms of a changing dynamic. What has happened? Okay, let's, let's first talk about what the government did. The economic survey, I'm sure you all realize the importance of the economic survey. For the uninitiated, it's what the finance minister usually lays out before the financial year. Now the most important, and this is the economic survey for the entire financial thing of the country. And the central theme there for this year is saving lives and saving livelihoods. So you understand where we are all coming from. The economic survey also tells us that the pharma industry is all set to grow three times in the next decade. Where are we today? We're at a 41 billion US dollars. We expect it to reach 65 US billion dollars by 2024. And like they said, a three times growth by 2030 down to almost 120 to 130 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money for those people like me who are confused about million, billion dollars and conversion rates. You just hang on for another five, 10 seconds. We'll clear that too. However, it's not just the pharma, Indian pharma market, which includes exports, but also the biotechnology industry, which is very important in the healthcare industry. Even that is said to grow even higher at 150 billion US dollars by 2025, 26. And of course, of these $41 billion, 
half of it is roughly 50% give or take a percent here and there is in the domestic markets and the rest of it is for export in the international markets. Now, I promised all those people who were not so quick on their numbers, I wouldn't spend too much of time. I'm quite conscious I need to finish in 20 minutes. Simply put, what we're looking at by 2021, 41, US, 41 billion US dollars. That's about three lakh crores. That's a huge amount of money for the Indian pharma industry. Now, it's also said, I'm still on capital, this very, very determining C, the pharma industry has become the new darling of private equity funds. Quite clearly, you know, people are very skeptical, especially venture capitalists, private equity, should we invest in a pandemic or not? I do understand this is a pandemic uh, which uh, is uh, uh, you know, uh, related to the pharma industry. However, they conventionally have always been dips, but in the year 2020, and I'll show you some numbers in the next slide, the total P and VC flow into the pharma space overall has been much, much higher in 2020. How much higher has that been? Let's look at a graph. There we are. So you've got two little data points here. This little thing tells you the value which has been raised in million dollars. You can, I mean, the graph is there for all of us to see. Even if we were to add up all these three, which is Jan to September 17, 18, and 19, it does not even add up to a total of what kind of investments have happened from Jan to September 2020. Now, the other interesting part in- Mark, here, Mark, last week. Sorry, there was a little interruption, but fine. The other interesting part uh, of this statistic is this which are the number of deals. The number of deals have gone up almost twice from 10 to 19. The other significant portion here, which needs to be read is this, the average deal size has also gone up. You know, I mean, we do the math here. This would be each deal at an average of 36.8 million. And look at this, almost 1700 million. So not only have the number of deals gone up, not only has the investment gone up, the average Investment per deal obviously has also gone up substantially. So a lot of interest has been shown in so far as capital is concerned. Very clearly, it's the darling. Now, why has this happened? Firstly, definitely, I've not, the slide does look busy, but I've just put these red markers so your attention can go straight there. Huge expansion in domestic uh, consumption. Uh, you know, uh, this PLI coming in, <clears throat> China manufacturing, the problems associated with that, a lot of it, uh, now switching into India, self-reliance. So the private equities are also looking at all of this. And that's the one of the main reasons uh, that there has been so much of investment. So when there's capital in any industry and when there's capital backed, put in by venture capitalists and private equity funds, you're quite sure they've done their due diligence and you're quite sure it's actually going to lead to huge amounts of growth. The next C, after having seen capital, well, capital, while it's something, there has to be a huge amount of commitment undoubtedly, uh, and commitment has been shown by our government. And when I talk about commitment here, it's more of you know the policies and the environment, the ease of doing business, the huge amount of commitment, which has also now increased, of course. Definitely, it's because of the pandemic, because of the catastrophic situation that has so occurred, that there has been a deep realization. And this deep realization has, is what has actually got the government to put the money where their mouth is. While in the past, there were a huge amount of allocations done, but the seriousness in the rollout, I'm pretty certain this time will be far, far more than has been in the preceding years, quite clearly. So of course, it's, it's been advantage India uh, right along the, the cost efficiency that you have in India. But the point I was making was in terms of policy support, you know, Farm, Farm Vision 2020, you're talking of 100% FDI uh, for greenfield projects, uh, there is also 100% FDI for brownfield projects, but about 74% is uh, in the auto route. The rest, of course, has to go in uh, through some amount of uh, approvals. So things are getting easier. Increasing investments have already covered in great detail with you. What has the government done? The recent PLI, opening up of all these parks, Punjab government has established three pharma parks, uh, I mean, has announced three pharma parks. Like that, every other state is doing their little bit. Look at the kind of allocation that's gone in in the union in budget this year, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. They've been allocated 70, almost 74,000 crores. The Department of Health Research, and this is a very important topic as far as pharma is concerned, almost 2,700 crores there. 64,000 crores over the 
next six years through the famous Prime Minister's Atmanirbhar Swast Bharat Yojana. And of course, the Ministry of Ayush has also got a comfortable 3,000 crores. So there's huge amount of capital, there's huge amount of commitment, and therefore, I'm quite certain there will be a huge amount of delivery. Having said that, what is the other dynamic that has emerged very clearly uh, in the industry today? It is all about collaboration. Very simply, you pick up the paper today, you will read that Pfizer is finally, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Uh, the research company, the German research company behind them has now picked up someone in Hong Kong to manufacture for them. Uh, it's happening all over. If it's happening within our own country. Um, uh, Sputnik uh, uh, is being manufactured by six pharma companies in India. So uh, this sort of collaboration is really uh, happening beautifully. Earlier, it was extremely cursory, another seed early. Occasionally, th there was some amount of collaboration. You can't typically call uh, contract uh, manufacturing crams as uh, collaboration. That's just outsourcing. But what is there now? Okay, let's look at an example which I've got here again. Now look at it. Pfizer, it's an American company. BioNTech is a German research company. And they have only today or yesterday announced that they're going to get people in Hong Kong to manufacture. Look at the kind of collaboration that's happening. There's more. In fact, today, uh, as we speak, the 21st of May, in Rome, you're having a global health summit also. Soon they're going to come out with uh, the Rome Declaration. The Rome Declaration is going to make things easier, where people are going to collaborate with these countries, are going to collaborate with each other, businesses are going to collaborate with each other. It's all because of this. Again, the World Health Summit, clearly Berlin, 24th to 26th of October this year, all they're talking about is global public health, global public good. So it's happening at all levels. It's happening at the thought leaders level. It's happening at the government level. It's happening at the capital level. So it can't get better for our industry than what it is currently. Another very important dynamic that's come about, and this may not be so pandemic uh, driven, but a lot of complementary uh, capabilities uh, are being seen. What do we mean by that? It's, it's simple. It's, it's nothing but advanced analytics, which are being used, natural language processing capabilities which are then assisting clinical decision support. From here and onwards, I will now switch tack to the importance of technology in all of this, the importance of being digital in all of this, because as a keynote speaker, it's my job to set the context, not just tell you what the changing dynamics of the industry are today, the way I see it, uh, but also how technology dependent this entire game is going to be. Time, I don't want other speakers waiting. I do have another three, four minutes. Care. The care is not just about, you know, having a, uh, your mother looking after you anymore or a family doctor looking after you. Care today has become extremely personalized. It's all outcome based. And again, here, technology and being digital, all approaches are going to be digital. Let's read what's on the slide for us very clearly. Uh, take a Parkinson's uh, patient, a guy who forgets and things like that. He's got a chip on pill technology with him to monitor his drug taking. A smart watch monitors his condition, sends him reminders, you know, have your little uh, pill that you need to have. It also sends reports uh, to the doctor maybe uh, for compliance. Health status reports go there. And therefore, when these nudges and alerts come to the health specialist, they can also reach out to the patient, coach their patients on lifestyle change, whatever it may be, and customize everything remotely. Don't we all realize today the importance of being remote? And the importance of being remote can only come with te technology. It can only come with a digitally enabled approach. And therefore, the importance of the discussion today in terms of technology. Having said that, control. Now, when I talk of control, I talk of the patients because the whole game plan of the healthcare industry, whether it's pharma, whether it's biotechnology, whether it's uh, health insurance, whatever it may be, the entire healthcare ecosystem is focused only on the patient. And today, the patient is the guy who's totally in control. He's no more that guy who's lying on a bed and there's a doctor sub being escorted by another flunky carrying his uh, little examination kit behind him. Today, the patient is in total control of everything. And that changes the entire dynamic. So that's exactly what I have. And very clearly, they are out to take responsibility for their own health. While this may be dangerous in some views, I've all, when I've called on various doctors, you, you, know, you find these little posters outside, leave Google out when you enter my chambers and things like that. 
But the fact is, it's a far more aware patient today. It's a patient who's totally in control. And therefore, the entire healthcare ecosystem has to deliver to that patient who's totally in know of everything and is in total control of everything. And that changes the dynamic for people who are into digital and technology in the healthcare space. Convergence. <clears throat> See, earlier, what would happen? I mean, you walk into your bioequivalence facilities uh, in your manufacturing facilities in your R&D center, you'll find hordes and hordes of heaps and heaps of papers, you know, uh, child-parent relationships between molecules, call them what you want. But today, everything is available uh, digitally, and rightly so, it should be. And therefore, everything, I'm saying in so far as care is concerned, is protocolized. That is, in which clinical decisions on the best treatment options can be suggested to physicians by an automated decision algorithm informed by advanced analytics. So it's, it's an entire convergence of 150 different things which is, of course, nothing but artificial intelligence, if I were to put it simply in machine learning, to rapidly source, collate, analyze, and then present to the decision maker two or three crisp insights, which then will assist the decision maker in taking a correct decision. And therefore, this is what, uh, is what I mean by calling convergence. Now, let's look at the flip side of, you know, much of the Indian farmers industry, 1,50,000 crores domestic, all of it, not all of it, uh, but comfortably 85% of that uh, are our medical representatives who are out in trade, calling on doctors, ensuring prescription offtakes so that sales can happen. So they are a very important component of the Indian pharma industry. How does it impact them? I've got it there in the second red box beneath. Marketing and sale forces, even they need to, some companies have already started uh, and uh, I was in a presentation by Apple just about two hours uh, prior to this, where we were talking of how we can use uh, digitization uh, in my current company. Uh, so that's important. How is it going to impact it? It's all there. You need to understand what advanced analytics are. What are we doing today? Uh, what are our medical representatives doing today? They're physically going down, trying and, you know, hanging out on the counter of a chemist trying to understand the insights of the doctor's prescription habits. For the initiated, you know, that's a process called RCPA. That RCPA, if it's put in through a digital platform and is analyzed and is presented to the decision maker on a click of a button, it makes his life so much more easy. It gives him directed medical communication to go into the chambers of a doctor and talk sense rather than just beat around the bush the doctor humors that person because the doctor is also, you know, uh, uh, interested in meeting a medical representative for a variety of reasons. But the fact is that call is going to result in zero conversions. So if it has to facilitate a directed communication onto a doctor sitting there in the chamber, that little medical representative has to be enabled with insights. And if these insights move in through a digitized sort of a cable, I don't mean a physical cable, I'm talking of a virtual cable that comes in, that I'm going to meet, let's say, Dr. Ekta Dube, and Dr. Ekta Dube has a huge propensity uh, to prescribe a particular molecule, but she is not prescribing my brand. What do I have to tell her so that the propensity to prescribe a particular molecule increases? Sorry, the brand increases. So it has to be extremely sharp. And this can only happen with convergence of a variety of inputs, which have sort of got churned together and come to that person on the ground to deliver it in front of the doctor. Communication channels, quite similar. <clears throat> the other C that I'm talking of today, again, for pharmaceutical medical representatives, medical and science lies in people, it's, it's very important. Everything is coming together today. Internet, applications, social media. Patients are getting that much more aware. Help groups are happening on WhatsApp. Communication channels are omnidirectional. And this is all thanks to technology that's taking place. I've got two, three more points. Uh, Ekta, can I get another two, three minutes? Yes, please. Okay. Do tell me when you're fed up of me. I'll stop straight away. The other insight what we need to understand today is bricks versus clicks. Clearly, I think most of us are people who are aware of what's happening in the industry. Obviously, the clicks are getting far more than bricks, and it's not just pandemic-related. 
yes, the pandemic has accelerated the transition from just bricks to clicks, but clicks are something that are here to stay. Clicks are something that we need to click to at the earliest. And therefore, just a quick survey, and this is a McKinsey report, essentially uh, of the European countries. The fact of the matter is this, that more than 75% of all patients expect to use digital services in the future. And the way digitization is taking place in India, let me just on the side make one little comment. A lot of people who are you know, cursing the way the vaccine rollout has happened in the country, I just want to paint a situation to all of you. If there was no technology, if there were no Aadhaar cards is what I'm saying, can you imagine the pandemonium that would have reigned in our country today for the vaccine? Thanks to that one little technologically supported thing that this government, our governments have done earlier, of having an Aadhaar card as like a social security number, we've at least been able to efficiently roll it out. There is technology that's supporting it. There are apps that are supporting it. So technology is doing it and therefore we need to thank technology and have a realization that this is the only thing that's going to keep changing far, far rapidly. And therefore we need to not just keep pace, but outpace it. Digital services is expected to increase across all age groups. I do understand that the senior people, but the point I'm making is it is increasing. This is today and this is in the future. So you see the size of the bar chart of the future is going up across all channels of communication. So like I said earlier, it's digital interaction and it's clicks, clicks, clicks. I'll quickly cover these aspects of being cost effective, Compliance. So there will be huge amount of regulation, but that's just to get the C in place, which is compliance. As also, like I've been saying right along, it's technology that's going to be the catalyst to get all this going. I won't go into too much of the slide because Ekta's thrice she's opened up a camera. I know I'm running short of time. Uh, and I'm sure all of this, the key role of technology in scaling Indian pharma is going to be discussed by an amazing panel. I mean, the reason why I started off with a disclaimer that I'm not an expert, when I looked at the panel who's gonna come up and speak, I felt like a little ant. So uh, with that in mind, I let this uh, be taken uh, by the panel. I'm sure they'll be discussing this and more uh, when they come up to you. And this of course is my last slide really, everything that you can imagine is going to go up on the cloud, except one thing, you'll all want your spouse to also go up in the cloud. That's not gonna happen <laughs> in very soon except the spouse who you wish to see on the cloud there, everything else is going to go up on the cloud. So we need to be ready for it. And uh, I finished with it extremely rapidly. I've tried to give some sort of clarity, again, another C uh, with the dynamics that are we are presently seeing in the pharma industry. I hope I've been able to clear some cobwebs, but uh, having said that, if there are some questions, uh, I'll be more than happy. Uh, these are my coordinates. If there's any of you who'd like to be in touch with me, I'll be more than happy uh, to uh, interact with you today as also later. And we see Bhaskar has raised his hand. Yes, yes. So thank you, Mr. Atul, for sharing great insights. Yeah. So quickly, Bhaskar, you can uh, please put your question, introduce yourself and put your question. And I'll try and answer. Yeah, Bhaskar, Bhaskar you need really to unmute to... yourself and put your question. No, I Bhaskar, think you are my mute. Mistake. If there's any other question, okay. I'll be happy to take it. Yeah. Okay, so we have something on the chat room. Yeah, there's Sumit Sharma who said, see as in challenges you see in context you put in. So are uh, you wanting me to see what challenges there are? I think there's only one challenge really. The challenge lies between your ears. Uh, we have to see it. And I mean S W -E and not just a C. We have to see what's coming. We have to be extremely responsive to what's coming. The fact of the matter is we are already enabled. We already know it's there. We are already geared up for it. We only need to get into the convergence of it all. And I don't see any challenges except mindsets. Um, funding is no problem. There is huge amount of capital commitment. There's huge amount of technology. Um, uh, people who are totally qualified on the technology, there's huge research happening. We only have to have a growth mindset, really speaking. I don't foresee any challenges, really. Okay. Anybody Hello. else? Yeah. Sir, sir, am I audible? Yeah, Bhaskar. No? Bhaskar. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, giving information about 15 Cs. And now seeing this pandemic, then again, there is a 16 C. Definitely the government will be, you know, that uh, you know, create an awareness and definitely in future, the government will support to the pharma industry. Yeah. I am aware about that. Uh, for uh, manufacturing, they have created a special uh, um, economic yeah. zones. Yeah. But in terms of considering this pandemic, the our Indian industries have done a great job worldwide. You know that, and that have created the respect. You know that pharma companies as well as the pharma team members in the society. And now seeing this, government will definitely take care of the uh, in future for the R and D projects whatever yeah. the R&D supports will be there. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, Ekta gave me only 20 minutes. Had she given me more, I would have put one more C, which is creditable. There's been a creditable performance and that will get us far, far higher than where we are today. So yes, Bhaskar, I agree with you in total. Uh, the way the Indian uh, pharmaceutical industry has uh, emerged in the pandemic uh, with support, of course, from the government and uh, uh, other regulatory agencies, I think is extremely creditable. There was another answer I saw. Yes, the, I think they were talking in terms of, I didn't read the whole thing, uh, but a question around the data was German. But quite clearly, I think the, uh, how do I see it in an Indian context? I did mention it in the passing that I think Indians are far more digitally savvy than any other country, uh, quite clearly. Uh, we may not be that glamorous in our savviness, uh, but we are far more digitally savvy than any other country. And therefore I see those numbers, the other, the future bar, getting far, far, far higher than the current bar. I hope it answers your question. Okay. Yeah. So we have a few more questions, but we'll take after the session. Mr. Suri is going to be yeah. here, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so, I'll, 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 I have a meeting. Uh, I'll try okay. to stay for some time, but I will yes. have to sort of escape. Okay. Okay. Thank so, you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Shatul Suri. So now moving on to our next session, we have Mr. Ganesh Ramchandran. To speak about him, he is a global CIO with Elchem Laboratories. He is a digital transformation leader who has helped set up, grow, and turn around businesses. He brings over 25 years of expertise across PNL management, management consulting, and technology transformation. He has an in-depth exposure to best practices across all three levels that derive business, process, technology, and people. He has helped clients evolve technology strategies to drive their business vision and transform their businesses, evaluate and extract business value from their technology investments. And he's here with us to share his insights on innovations, riding the wave of transformation, AI, ML, and analytics. Over to you, Mr. Ganesh, to start your session. Thank you. You are on mute. Yes, I did realize that. Thank you. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, perfect. Oh, okay, good. So uh, thanks for the introduction, Ekta, and I hope you can all see my screen that I have put up. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, at the outset, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. And uh, thank you, Atul, for laying the initial uh, foundation and the context of what uh, we are really looking at as an industry and where technology is really playing a role. Uh, before I go ahead, I'd like to first start by thanking and saluting the healthcare practitioners and their teams for their yeoman service that they've been doing to make sure that uh, all people stay healthy. It's not been uh, an easy year professionally for many and personally too for many. So uh, it's been a difficult time. And I'd also like to thank the entire pharma industry and all the people who've been working together with the pharma industry to make sure that uh, essential supplies reach people to the last mile. So. Uh, I think from what Atul was mentioning, one thing which really jumped out very clearly was that change is inevitable. And the change that we're really talking of over here is really about saying, what is the change that you're seeing with this new thing of digital that has been going around? The surprising part is it's not really new. It has been around for quite a while. It's just that the pharma industry was a little late to start adopting many of the things on digital. So what we're going to be covering today, and I will keep it uh, brief with what we are looking to kind of get at, we'd be covering broadly four areas, and I'll try to keep some uh, time in the end for questions that you may have. We'll start by quickly talking about, so we all have a common understanding of what is the imperative for innovation. Many of us view it differently. Each of us see it from different angles. So I think it's good to get all of us on a common page. 
The second part is given that there are so many different things that really keep coming in, how do you choose where to focus? I think this becomes very, very critical, else you tend to start going all over the place. The third, and this is where I'll spend a bulk of the time in the discussion today, we'll talk more about select use cases across the value chain, which have analytics, AI, and ML. We'll then cover a little bit of the key learnings, and lastly, I'll go towards the questions. Now, if uh, one were to ask what has been the biggest thing that you've seen over the whole uh, period of the pandemic and beyond, I think the one thing that's come out very, very clearly is that across organizations in the pharma industry, the old way of working no longer works. Why is that so? The pharma uh, industry overall was one where we really saw a lot of face-to-face -face and physical interactions, whether it was the doctor meeting their patients, whether it was the way the pharma industry engaged with customers, which is doctors or stockists, or even extended partners like suppliers, or even clinical trials, which were done where we had volunteers who kind of came in for the R&D parts. But almost everything was done physically. I've spent a fair amount of my working career across consulting. I've spent about two decades in consulting across the globe and uh, across various industries. And one thing that has always struck me is that pharma as an industry was very, very resistant to looking at some of these kind of things. That resistance, I think, completely broke down during the pandemic. So the first biggest thing that really drove a lot of the change was the models of working. And what this really meant was you now had a scenario where people could probably not get into office because they were in a lockdown zone or they were unfortunately not very well, but work had to keep moving on. Like Dr. K.K. Garwal, uh, God bless him, rightly says the show must go on. And in such a scenario, what was the thing that you could really look to do? It necessitated that people could be able to work from wherever, which meant that you needed to provide them access in a secure manner from a remote location. They also needed to be able to do it from different devices, whether it was a mobile, a tablet, a laptop. All of these were the models of working, which no longer is something that uh, I think all of you have been seeing it. And I think all of you, especially in the tech uh, teams, have made this happen. So this is the first part of the change that you've all seen coming through. The second part is that the transformation is right across the value chain. If you were to just rewind a little and look at around March or April of the last year, the entire focus and most of the pharma industry was grappling with saying, how do we get business continuity to go through? How do we ensure that people can work remotely? How can people learn the different collaboration tools like one of the ones that we're using now? From there, it moved very quickly, almost by June, July into a lot more focus on the operational efficiency. But I think even then, and as it has gone even further, the whole area has shifted to value creation. I will talk a little more about value creation as we go ahead. But I think the key that we are all looking at now in terms of an imperative, which is fueling transformation, is value creation. The third aspect is where people are now looking for a single view of the data across the organization. Earlier, what we were seeing was you had data and analytics, which was largely by a function or at best by a process. Whereas what you needed to be looking at now was you needed more of something of an intelligent enterprise, different teams looking at the same source of truth. So there's no way by which you're having a scenario where people are saying that this is the right data or the other person saying, no, no, this is the right data and you're wasting time and reconciliation. So it's no question of saying that my data is better than yours, but it's the same data that everyone's seeing and people are acting on the data. Which brings me to my last point of where people have really been looking at saying, do I have a data-driven decision-making that can really come through? People are moving away, whether it is descriptive analytics that I largely see being provided in the pharma industry, to some part which is prescriptive and where there are a very few instances where we're actually going towards predictive, the whole thrust has now been on saying, what is the insight I can derive from this data? What action can I take out of it? And that necessarily means that I cannot have data which is coming to me once a quarter, once a month, or even once a week. I probably need to be having it a lot more frequently, which means that the whole way the systems are, the way you're kind of collating data, the way you have your data marts, your data warehouses, all of that needs to undergo a complete and radical shift. So these are a few things that I thought I'll just lay across to help us understand what are the real imperatives that we are looking at, which is driving the transformation. 
So there's so much to do. If you're a part of a technology leadership function like I am, I think one of the biggest things that you'll be seeing, and not just with your business leaders, but probably with your management teams and perhaps the board as well, is everyone wants a slice of the action. Everyone wants to know what can you do and how can you help me transform digitally? So when you have so much to do, where do you really start? This is the first one that I think one really needs to be looking at, at least for me, I have found this working very, very well. The first part is you really need to be working very, very collaboratively with the leadership team. Each team, for them, their priorities are important. So it makes sense to put it across. In my case, I'm fairly lucky. I have the reporting directly to the promoter. And the promoter is able to help in prioritization of the roadmap, depending on what the organizational priorities are. I think increasingly, this is what a technology leader is being expected to do. You're no longer, no one is bothered about what kind of technology you're putting in. That's something for you to look at. But clearly, what is the business value that you're going to be deriving and how do you prioritize your roadmap is something that starts coming to. I've spoken about value a couple of times, but to me, irrespective of the industry that you operate in, whether you're pharma, whether you work in FMCG, CPG, any of the industries that you were to look at, or even uh, financial services, there are broadly four key value drivers that matter. The first one is really how do you drive your top line? So what is the way in which you're able to get more revenue for your organization? The second value driver that one looks at is saying, how can I reduce the costs and hence impact the profitability? The third one, which I think is a lot more relevant in the pharma context really, is saying, how do I ensure better compliance? I would also extend it further to saying, how do I ensure better governance when you're looking at regulatory, especially for a listed company? And the fourth one, which I think has grown largely because of the pandemic, is the whole part of the user experience, not just the customer, but also the employees. How do you ensure that the employee has a nice, easy experience when working with the different applications that I'm sure you've all started using for different parts of your process now as the pandemic has kicked in? The third part has really been saying, how do I get towards, while doing all of this, you also need to keep in mind that you do have constraints. What are the kind of constraints you look at? There are constraints of skills that are there within the teams that exist. There's a problem also that your team is probably working on multiple projects. They are not really available, though you want to take on one more thing that has come and priorities have been changing so rapidly that it becomes very difficult to kind of say that I will take one and then go to the other. So if you look at the earlier times a few years ago, you had a nice scenario where if someone came saying that I needed a solution for it, you sat down and said, okay, you tell me what's your requirement. I will try and convert it into a system requirement and then I'll move it across. Today, no one has the time and energy for it. You need to be working in an agile manner. Your systems need to be flexible enough and you need to really be going through very, very rapidly. The third part is a lot of the solutions that you put in place, you do find that adoption is a challenge. And what you need to be looking at even before you jump into a journey, I would argue, is look at what is the change readiness of your organization to be taking on an initiative like this. And lastly, like I was mentioning just a little while ago, the patience levels are very, very little. People want solutions quickly and people want solutions that work. So the time you have to implement should be as quick as possible. Was that a question? Uh, oh, on mute, please. Thank you. So, with this kind of a prerogative and how you kind of prioritize where you want to take on initiatives, which ones you want to go to, here are a few things that I have seen happening across the pharma industry in the last 15 to 18 months. Some of these are relevant in India, and I'll focus on the one which I think is where I have seen the maximum amount of change at least from uh, my organization. And I would think it's true for most organizations in the pharma industry. The front office in the pharma industry was one that was not touched much by the kind of uh, digital interventions. What do I mean by that? Yes, almost all the sales teams uh, do carry tablets perhaps. They do uh, e-detailing to the doctors uh, and they have uh, the visual aid that is present on the tablets. Till there, you have some level of automation. But after that, if I were to kind of go through what we've been seeing through the pandemic, where the demand was so variable, 
you had a scenario where the demand was fluctuating and you had instances where there were some therapy areas that saw a huge boom because there was forward buying of medicines, especially for some chronic ailments where people were scared whether they would get the medications. In some cases, people put off surgeries which were not critical. And again, that meant that you needed to have further medications. How do you have your forecasting model being strengthened to account for it? How do you also have scenarios where you're seeing, like in some cases in acute therapies, for instance, in anti-infectives, gastrointestinal, there was a decline and a fairly dramatic decline in the overall industry volume sometime towards the first quarter of last year as the lockdown hit. How do you make sure that you're able to account for it so you don't have your capacity utilization at the, prod at the production, your working capital getting blocked up in things that are not moving, and more importantly, you're able to get the right drugs to the uh, customers who really need it. And that brings me to my second point where we've been seeing a lot more of this being used. Atul briefly mentioned about uh, the part of RCPAs when he covered uh, in his presentation. What we did was around uh, 2019 end, we started looking at uh, saying that we want to start tracking the secondaries that customers have. And this to me was a good classical uh, uh, AI, ML, analytics kind of a problem that we were seeing. Because what we had was we had different uh, stockists and each of them had their own formats in which they had uh, you know, the capture that they were maintaining of the inventories. We clearly realized that unlike in a CPG context where you could actually get a distributor management system and put that in place and pretty much pick up from there what the secondaries were, that's not going to happen in the pharma context. So what we ended up doing was we ended up getting the statements from them and we ran an AI ML program which basically read the different information that was coming. And there were challenges very, very clearly. So for instance, one of the drugs that Alchem has is Pan D. So uh, Stockist 1 had called it Pan Space D. Stockist 2 had it called Pan without Space D. Stockist 3 had it called Pan hyphen D. Stockist 4 had it as Pan small D. Another one had Pan capital D. So you realize there are different kinds of permutations combinations coming in. So for one SKU, you've got different kinds of combinations. So how do you train your model to realize that all of these are actually the same skew that you're looking at? And hence, when you're looking at what is the secondary you need to pick up, you're able to say that, hey, this is actually the same. So you need to be able to train your model to be able to get across and pick that each of these are the way it is supposed to be. So that's on the secondary that we'd initiated. And Alchem now, if you notice our uh, earnings calls, we call out our secondaries. And I think this has helped us a lot more in making sure that our stockouts are reduced and that we do not have non-moving products which lie around with the stockist and eats up the stockist's ROI and ours as well. The third is the whole RCPA that Atul alluded to. Now on the RCPA front, of course, again, what we're trying to get is, is there a way by which, like he was rightly pointing, can I link the primary, secondary and the tertiary sales through an analytics layer that comes across, which gives a clear picture saying, where do I need to focus my sales efforts on and how do I really drive it? I will come to the last part in the interest of time. I noticed that time is ticking. So I will kind of move on towards the last one on customer engagement. Atul mentioned uh, this again briefly when he spoke about it. One of the biggest challenges that we saw when uh, the pandemic hit was how do we get the engagement of our customers, which is the doctors in this case. And the industry used different approaches some of them tried uh, going in and uh, doing calls virtually with uh, doctors. But obviously, when the doctors had much more pressing priorities like uh, patient care to take care of, this really didn't go down very well across the industry. Webinars were tried as well, but fatigue, I think, of the webinars set in very, very quickly. So somewhere around March when we were of last year, when we were brainstorming and saying that we are seeing this coming, what do we really do? We looked at picking up and going and talking to our doctors the way you classically do it. We spoke to about 3,000 of our doctors and figured out uh, it was a cross section across the country, different therapies, different locations covered. And we tried to figure out what is the biggest problem that they're grappling with? What could we help you with? And the clear answer that came across from the analytics thing that we ran was saying that doctors said, I am worried about how my patients are doing during the pandemic. And if they can't come to the clinic, how do I take care of their, their health? And they are also very concerned. So how do we really manage this? So what we did was we set up a way by which doctors could get 
and set up a virtual clinic to engage their patients. We call this Connect to Clinic. We did our beta version launch of this last June. Uh, and uh, June, July, we worked with doctors to figure out what are the kind of features they would require. Uh, you could look this up. This is called Connect to Clinic. And uh, currently, we have over 25,000 plus doctors who are on this platform. And this, we believe, has really helped us strengthen our customer engagement because this is nothing which I get uh, out of it. Whatever happens between the doctor and the patient is only between them. Uh, but it has helped us in making sure that we were there for our customers, the doctors, when they needed it. And we were able to solve, in some part, a problem that they were facing. The last one, which I've called out over here, I think this has been there, uh, which is the AI for in-store experience. This has been there for ages now for uh, in the consumer products and retail industries. Uh, typically, when any new packaging is launched, any color uh, is looked at, the taste, smell, all of these, these are uh, uh, have been looked at where you use a mix of emotions uh, which are there and uh, what emotion it triggers in your brain when you're looking at uh, the color or the smell and you use that analytics to come up with saying what kind of packaging or color or taste or smell would work better. And hence you have a better chance of it succeeding as you compete with other products, especially if you're looking at an OTC kind of a, a product. The second area which I'd like to cover briefly is uh, the whole area of the distribution. We spoke about the variability in the demand and what uh, that was creating. So how can one look at the whole load patterns? How can one figure out what is the kind of vehicle movement that you have? Because there were some cases where vehicles got held up and we were unaware of it, which meant that stockists were running out of stock and you expected that the uh, truck would reach, but it really did not happen. So making sure that you had analytics which started and where you were strengthening your whole forecasting system, going all the way from the forecast, taking it back to your distribution planning, taking it back to your material requirement planning, to the production planning, and all the way back to your procurement is something that we have started trying to strengthen. And I think across the industry, this is a use case where we've been seeing a lot more of uh, AI coming in as you're looking to strengthen your forecasting models, which is really the start of your whole planning process. The third area, and I think this is one which has been uh, looked at across most organizations in manufacturing and pharma is no different, is how can you look at improving the uptime industry 4.0 is something that has really come in and the analytics that comes in through that really helps in driving your predictive maintenance. How do you account for the vibrations uh, that the machine has? How do you account for heating that the machine has? And any of these parameters, if they are going out of range, you're able to quickly go in and do a predictive maintenance to ensure that uptime is increased. The fourth area, we spoke about this briefly already, which is the whole AIML in the planning and forecasting across the supply chain. The fifth one, and this is one which I think has been uh, uh, there for a fairly long period of time, which is uh, in R&D uh, quality. How do you reduce your time to market? Uh, you don't need to look any further than the whole uh, thing of how the COVID vaccine uh, kind of came across. And this, I think, is true across all the companies as you're looking to make sure that you're able to get out of the gate faster and crunch your whole cycle time that you take, and not just the cycle time, but even identifying the right kind of uh, molecules that you're taking on, the right drug discovery, the right uh, uh, volunteers that you're taking on for the trials and so on and so forth. So for all of these, I think there's a lot of analytics use cases that are there available fairly well used. We've also looked at a few around the finance areas uh, where we've used RPA for uh, accounts tables. There's a lot of analytics that are being leveraged for uh, better spend management, especially in these times when you want to ensure that uh, you are keeping a close eye on what costs are going through. And if you're running schemes, how do you figure out which schemes are going to work better? And how do you also make sure that you're able to leverage that for providing better incentives for the field folk especially in these times, because in some cases, they've been very, very badly impacted, depending on the therapy areas that they were kind of going after. From a HR perspective, we spoke about uh, the experience as a key lever that uh, we really were looking at. And this, I think, has been one that uh, we've clearly seen where bots have been used right across. We also have been seeing cases with AI and ML. I think multiple organizations have been doing pilots, so have we, on improving the whole uh, engagement and the productivity. So these were a few use cases that I noticed, which uh, I have seen in the industry. Uh, I'm sure there would be more, but this was just a glimpse of some of the ones that I have seen where you've used AI, ML, analytics to kind of help in improving the four key levers that I spoke about. But there are a few key learnings as well, which I wanted to leave you with before I wind up. 
The first one is on data. I think the biggest thing when you're looking at any analytics AI ML journey is on the quality and the quantity of your data. Data, of course, like most of you are aware, comes in two types. There's a structured data and an unstructured data. The unstructured data is a little more difficult to handle, but that's typically where you see a lot more benefits that you could possibly drive and take through, especially when you're looking to model consumer behavior, when you're looking to model forecast patterns or anything else. When you're looking at your data itself and you're looking to kind of get the uh, quantity of the data that is there, or if you're training an AI ML model, you typically need at least a good two, three years of good solid data to be able to train your model and make it work well. In the current scenario where you had a lot of changes happening over the last year because there was a lot of variation that kind of went through, how do you also let your model know that this is an aberration and this is not typically what you'd look at? So that bias as well gets uh, uh, kind of taken into account when you're building out your model is something you want to look at when you're talking of your data. The second, of course, is in realizing the value. I know of many cases there are multiple startups who are there who are uh, providing a lot of these kind of AI ML uh, kind of cases. One common thing I hear from them right across is that it's almost like uh, we are just running POC after POC with a few organizations and we're not really seeing the uh, light of it coming through. I would really suggest that if you're looking to take on any of this uh, initiatives and you're looking to work with any of the partners here, it may be a good idea for you to define what is your success ratio? What is the success criteria you're going to use to say, hey, has this worked and given us the value we are looking at or if it has not. Also, when you're looking at the value realization, many times it's not about the technology, which is a problem. It's about the change adoption that I'd spoken of earlier and you may want to watch out for that too. The third is in terms of skill gaps that you may have. Many a time within uh, our own teams, you may notice that people are not aware of some of the skills that may be needed for running these kind of uh, initiatives. And what I notice across, and if you look at Gartner's two-speed model, which talks of saying there is a way by which you, you run the business normally, and there's one where you innovate or change. The run the business parts, I think most IT teams have been doing it for a fair period of time, and they know that fairly well. They can do a fairly good job of that. When it comes to these newer areas, there you need to work a lot more collaboratively with your business teams. I think in the current context, there is no question of saying that you're a technology person and he's a business person. I think the boundaries have just blurred. So you need to be able to kind of get across on both the sides, figure out what are the functional requirements, figure out what kind of technology things can be provided and leverage and work on that change and get it through along with your team and call out those skill gaps, adequately staff the team for it. The last one, especially if you're working with uh, AI, ML, and if you're looking at anything which has uh, privacy concerns like patient data, so for the, kind of the connect to clinic one that I, I was telling you about, we have very, very clearly called it out, which is relevant and applicable to all the HIPAA standards when we kind of go through with it. The entire data is encrypted. The only people who can see uh, the information are the doctor and the patient. No one else gets to see what has happened between them. I don't know if the doctor has cut a prescription. I don't know what he has prescribed. So the entire privacy part becomes very, very important. Security is an area which has been a huge area of concern. And you really want to make sure it's not just for any AI ML, but I would argue for anything that you're looking at, InfoSec, I think, and security by design is something you want to build in to make sure that your transformation journey is not getting derailed. I will leave it with this and I hope you found it useful. Uh, thank you again, Brain Atlantic's team for having me on uh, this discussion. I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you have. Uh, please do take care and stay safe. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Ganesh for sharing great insights. Uh, we do have a question from Praveen Kumar. Uh, it's on the chat box. It's like, do you feel laws like aggregate spent and transparency reporting can boost digital adoption in sales and marketing space? Without such law, do you feel that digital adoption can proceed beyond pandemic? I genuinely believe it can. I don't think uh, you need to have a law to kind of take it. Uh, and, and in most cases, I would argue that uh, anything that you're looking at transformation is not happening because of a law. Uh, it's happening because there is a clearly articulated business need that is there for it. Sure, a law can help in kind of taking it further across. So for instance, the telemedicine guidelines that came, it wasn't a law, but it's a guideline that came across that helped in accelerating the adoption of digit of uh, telemedicine by many of the uh, uh, HCP community. That I believe only accelerates it, but you need to have the basic need that is there, which the business should drive. And it's not just about the law that can really help you in driving it.
Thank you. Yeah, so we have one more question to quickly take that up from Ashwini. What steps pharma companies are taking to confront growing problems of pharmaceutical waste? And I'm sure AI analytics would certainly help to reduce it. Is there any major trend with the pharma industry today about it? Are you talking about the environmental waste here, Ashwini? Ashwini, you can uh, just unmute and put your question. Yeah, I'm talking about the environmental waste. And I guess because there has been some report what I read uh, recently that um, because Hyderabad is one of the city which is uh, exporting around 50% of the drugs produced out of India, I guess. And they had, there was a German university which did a research and they claimed that um, there has been a lot of uh, concern about this uh, contamina contamination of the water resources out there. So, so I guess that, that definitely the technology should help the pharma industry because most of the wastes are coming from there. So I don't know, is there any specific trend on that? I'm not sure whether it is an analytics uh, problem, really. Uh, I think analytics can definitely help you in uh, getting a little more insight as to where is the thing that you're generating, which could be a waste. But I think uh, one of the good parts, particularly in the manufacturing side and in the R&D side, uh, a lot of the processes are fairly well laid out and documented, Ashwin. And mm -hmm. there has been some amount of tech that's already gotten over there. It's only likely to increase even more, but that's probably more of the remote areas of working rather than just on this alone. Because because you mentioned about this predictive analytics uh, in terms of the forecast and everything, because we know that, uh, I don't know exact percentage, maybe you have the numbers, how much wastage of the drug happens when they expired or something in the, and that could be, so that definitely could be stopped using the technology and the analytics. That was my impression, so. Absolutely, and that would not be at the plant level, that's more when it goes out into the field level. Right. Mm -hmm. That's at the stockage, at the chemist, at all those levels is where you see the returns coming back and uh, that, that, that becomes a waste. At the production level, it is much lesser. And from mm -hmm. a waste perspective, I think a lot of the processes there are fairly well laid out. And of course, there's always scope to improve the yields and kind of take it through, especially for the trial batches that you do for R&D. Uh, My question was more pertaining to the distribution level when you really get it distributed, because that's something also which contributes a lot of wastage and that's something. Having a better second possible will definitely give you a lot more picture on it. Thanks, Ganesh. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ganesh, I would really request you. There are two more questions for you in the chat box. If you can just revert on the chat box. It is from Sumit and uh, Rajan Jindal. Uh, that would be really helpful. Yes? Right now? You can uh, mention on the chat box. You can just reply them if you, yeah. Because yeah. we have a lot of questions coming in. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. I'll be around for another five, ten minutes and then I'll need to drop off to you. But uh, thank you once again. Uh, and uh, all the best. Take care, guys. Yes, thank you so much for being here. So uh, now moving on further, I would like to invite Marut Sethia, Senior Vice President, Emerging Markets and Devices in DG. To speak about him, Marut is a Senior Healthcare Executive who is passionate about growing business and a marketer focused on enhancing organizational competitiveness. He's an advocate of a startup mindset and large organization and his main areas of expertise includes PNL leadership, business transformation, incubating new businesses, revenue marketing, and finance management. Marut has spent over 13 years in GE Healthcare, gaining multiple experiences, and also was part of the executive leadership team as chief marketing officer of South Asia and PNL leader of education solutions across South Asia and Africa. He's here with us today to share insights on digital innovation in pharmaceuticals, building an efficient and future-ready organization. Over to you, Marut, to start your session, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ekta. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, yes. All good there. Excellent. Excellent. So thank you very much for having me here. And uh, uh, I love the comments from the previous speaker, Ganesh and Atul. Uh, it's very insightful. And uh, they obviously know much more about the pharma industry about, than I do. But having been part of the healthcare system for quite some time, uh, I just want to take a quick take on what does it mean from a future standpoint. Two years back, uh, 2019, when we thought about the future on how healthcare industry, pharma industry is going to look like, we thought of three-year plan, five-year plan, 10-year plan. Now, in the last 18 months or so, our horizon of future has shrunk significantly. Whatever was relevant uh, to us a year back suddenly seems to be completely irrelevant. The capability, capacity that we built over a long period of time, suddenly seem insufficient for lack of a better word. And even now, 
every three months, uh, you are really rethinking your approach uh, and you're retweaking your strategy with the changing market dynamics. So I don't know if anybody has a crystal ball that can even tell us six months down the line what the future of this industry is going to look like. Uh, so I thought maybe it is prudent for us to look at the voice of a larger group of customers that I'm going to share with you. So Indigene did this uh, survey of about 650 HCPs across US, Europe, and APAC regions uh, to look at how are they feeling about the industry? What, what are they looking at uh, from the, to get from the pharmaceutical industry and how their worldview has changed? And in my head, that's a great indication of what we need to do as a pharma industry to meet those expectations. So that's how I've kind of uh, put into context uh, my 20, 25 minutes here with you guys. Uh, and then maybe we'll also look at a couple of models that have really helped uh, global pharma, pharma companies to deliver at scale. And I love, Dinesh, when you, you're talking about uh, the compliance and governance part of it. It's not enough to set up an experiment. It's not enough to set up an initiative. What is really needed is one, to deliver these transformations at scale. And second, make sure that we, are, we have the right compliance and governance um, ethics that are in place to see this all for next a lo much longer period of time. That's the only way to get the right dividend out of these investments. So let me quickly start, and this is how we used to see all the challenges, right? I mean, Indigen has been a proponent of digital for 20 years now, right? So, so it's, it's, it's not news to us. It's no different for us when, when the whole industry has now started thinking about digital. But the way the worldview has changed, the way the problem statement has changed from, can I get my cost down? Can I have a better impact? Can I get more productivity to more existential questions? Can I even run my business without having digital as a main pillar of it? Do people, do HCPs even trust the information that I'm sending to them? Does the channel and the information services that I have put into place over decades, is it even relevant? And how effective is my messaging to my customer when I don't have my rep sitting in front of him or her. So those are the those are suddenly the questions that uh, that have started coming up uh, in last year and a half, two years, right? And the models that we thought were rock solid, were unshakable, uh, if you will, is are suddenly being uh, being questioned every day, and they are not sufficing or they are not supporting the kind of growth and the ambitions. Uh, that the pharma companies have. Forget about commercial ambition. I mean, even if you want to help people and, and get the information out to them, we don't know if our channels are effective enough. Right? So these are, this is, these are the moment of truths that we found out when, uh, when we did this survey with the, the 650 HCPs across the globe. And we'll not talk about all of them. Let's talk about uh, the ones in the green. Right? When you think about, uh, you create a piece of content, circulate over 20 channels, to different HCPs. As a marketer, we don't even realize what is the capability of the content to adapt to different channels. Does it lend to the same messaging as it would have in, let's say, email versus a Twitter versus a LinkedIn post versus your own website? Right? Is your content discoverable? Uh, half the time, we spend a lot of time, effort, money in designing the right message and the right content, but we, we very uh, frequently forget that our content is only as good as uh, the number of people it reaches. If your content is not discoverable enough, uh, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of good work, uh, but the impact is always negligible. So the thought process that we have now we have now to live with is how do we change it from effort to impact? So, so that's a big mindset change that has been driven, especially on the digital side of the, of the pharma companies. Are we choosing the environment uh, carefully? Well, this talks about virtual and uh, conference venues, but environment in general, have we considered the environment when we are passing on a message? In, in today's context, I mean, it is, uh, the, the conversation doesn't start without asking people about how the health of their family members is. Right? I mean, today, every conversation started like that. And that's the outcome of the environment that we live in. Now, if we feel that this environment is only applicable in our personal life, I think that's a big mistake. The environment lends to a change in communication, not just in personal, but also in professional ways. 
and, and that's what one is one of the things we realized uh, through this survey. And then, of, of course, there is the, the obvious one that we need to be flexible in terms of when you reach out to people. When you engage HCPs on social media, what is the channel that you engage them in? How frequently do they visit social media? What time of the day? So all those things are now as critical as uh, the, the messaging that you're trying to drive through your content. So, so these are some of the things that we learned. And now when you put it in context, now 80% of our communication over the last year and a half has become digital. But have the channels for us matured enough? Right? So again, we'll not talk about all of them, but let's take a few of them which are which we feel today are the mainstream. So email, I think no marketer worth their salt uh, would ignore email as a communication channel. But you, if you look at the blue box uh, under marketing email, 46% of HCPs are not satisfied with the kind of communication that they're getting from email. So when you as a marketer or as a digital farmer leader, when you think about the impact, 50% of your effort is not generating the kind of return that you wanted to, to get. Uh, Ganesh spoke about webinar fatigue and you know I, I can't agree more. 39% of our HCPs are dissatisfied with the way the webinar is concerned. It goes back to the moment of truth. Sometimes the context is not right. Sometimes the environment is not taken into consideration. Sometimes the schedule is not right. So all of these come together and deliver a suboptimal experience. A lot of organizations today are gravitating towards social media as a channel of uh, communication to HCPs. 49% of HCPs are dissatisfied. Right? Now, and, and, you know, this is borderline expected because these channels, at least from a pharmaceutical industry standpoint, are not mature. What the, the FMCG industry did to these channels five, 10 years back is what the pharma industry is now learning to do so that they can reach out to the right uh, target uh, group with the right impact. So, so that's what we learned really that, you know, our mainstay, mainstay of our channel landscape needs a whole lot of improvement for us to get, create and get the desired impact. And, you know, this is another, another trending uh, a chart on uh, how, how we are perceived, not just, uh, so basically it's talking about the shift that we are seeing between pre-COVID and post-COVID world. While all of us want to go revert to a status quo uh, of what uh, pre-COVID looked like, and we would love to go back to that stability and uh, love to go back to that safety and security, uh, things have fundamentally changed. HCPs, organizations, your CFOs have discovered that there is a newer, and a potentially a better way of reaching out to your audience. Now, we all know that there are pitfalls. We all know through the moment of truth that I showed you that there are challenges. But the, the, newer, way of, the newer way of working is probably not going to be 100% of what we saw in the past. It is going to go through, a, uh, go through some kind of shift. The channels which were less used would, be, uh, would, be become, would become more and more prevalent as long as we are able to find a way to demonstrate the impact, which is where I think the, the, the crux lies for any digital uh, professional or any digital uh, leader uh, in the pharmaceutical company. Right? And you can see some of the examples here. We don't need to go through the chart. They're fairly, fairly intuitive on how we see the, the traction changing. People like uh, HCPs are used to the fact that they will probably get a call or the detailing will be done uh, through a digital channel. So they don't feel that there is a need for a, a rep in most cases to uh, come and sit, uh, sit in front of their office for half an hour. Right? Uh, and, and that's the realization uh, with the rep as well. If the rep can uh, be more a uh, multi-channel or omni-channel rep versus uh, only doing physical meetings, they find it much more productive. Our reps have not stopped working. They are still productive. They're still reaching out to doctors, just that they're using different channels to do it. Right? So the answer that we'll get at the end of this, and hopefully this end soon, uh, is going to be somewhere in the middle. And that is what this chart is uh, trying to capture. So now, now that we understand that there is, there is a significant shift in the way, we, the, the way we have thought about it in the past, and how the industry is going to reshape itself or reform itself in the future, how do you really drive a good customer experience? And in our report, after talking to uh, a few hundred people, this is what we felt are some of the basic tenets of creating a superior customer engagement model. 
how do you create agility right you have to make sure that uh, your team your team on the ground your team as tele reps your team as uh, media social media management your team on the digital side understand what a rep is going through on the ground and they are able to tweak and change their communication uh, the way they feel is going to be most impactful right how do you how do you sorry how do you create a, a learning environment for your team uh, what is what has worked in the past is probably not going to work in the future so how do you reiterate and don't just implement ai uh, in a systemic way but implement the learning model uh, in the organization so so that's going to be super important how do you have a data driven decision making how do you make sure that your decisions are how do you first capture the right data and then as a leader have the access to a process data which will help you drive decision making right? so all of these become uh, super important and all of this ultimately leads you to become a better partner to your customer versus the the, the scenario only which is a promoter uh, uh, how how do you become a messenger to deliver the right information which will help an xcp in improving their practice versus trying to promote it back so that's the shift that has to be driven to create a superior customer excellence model this is some other insight that we got uh, on how how this shift needs to be driven uh, the focus the centric the centricity of it's not the brand anymore the the circle that you draw in the center when when you start thinking about what your brand is going to stand for how do you promote your brand how do you take the message out it's not going to be that this is my drug and let's look outward it's going to be the customer how do you make sure that you start from how do i support my customer and then look inward out uh, to get to that message how do you make sure that you are more responsive uh, gone are the days when you uh, when you create a beat plan for 3 months and make sure that this is how you touch your customers uh, but that nimble uh, nimble attitude the agility is going to help you deliver the message and you know the focus has now changed to how do you make sure the message is delivered and, and less on the channel right so so this is this is what is going to uh, the be the mainstay of a customer centric model and ultimately all of this going to come is going to come back into a coordinated format where your reps journey and your digital journey at some point are going to converge now some organizations already have a head start they've already implemented some of these uh, crm models that allow you to do this and some of them are going to lag behind uh, but ultimately the success uh, is going to come to people to integrate these journeys versus think of thinking about it one way or the other the content the channel and the message uh and, you know this is what i was talking to you about the the inward out model when you put customer strategy or your customer at the center of it you understand their needs you understand uh, the data that is coming back to you which was historically just thrown away and, and you know nobody was looking at it if you look at that if you collect the voice of customer if you come back with your insight design an operation to reflect what your customer really wants put the right governance metrics on it have the have the mindset uh, of a compliance mindset and a governance mindset which will help you uh, get the right message out have the right team upskill them uh, a lot of people have learned new things uh, during these lockdowns and and make that as a part of your organizational fabric that's when the message is going to be delivered and i was as i was saying earlier this has to be backed by a robust technological framework right you cannot have a, a great strategy a great set of people uh, a great governance structure but a weak technological backbone because all of that ultimately uh, is going to impact the way you deliver and the way the message is going to be perceived uh, by the ncp and and that is where we feel that uh, without this robust technological backbone uh, we are uh, the other parts of the investment will not give you the dividend that you need Uh, we spoke a little bit about this, so, so I'm going to uh, quickly uh, short change this. But one piece that I feel is super important uh, in this is on the capacity building part. Uh, and when I say capacity building, it is not just uh, the technical capacity or the technical knowledge that your people need to have, but also the knowledge of the newer channels. How do you make sure that the a rep uh, on the ground who's for decades used to face to face meeting how is he or she adapting to the newer versions of reaching out to the customer how do they get the comfort level of let's say doing stuff as a e detailing format right so all those 
capability has to be built into the, the current models to not just repurpose, but also reskill your current workforce to deliver the impact that you're looking for. I think my last slide, or last couple of slides are gonna talk about how do you tie this to the organization, uh, organizational impact, right? In the end, there are only three things that, that matter uh, to a business leader. Are you increasing your revenue? Are you reducing your cost? Or are you increasing your market share or share of voice? And all of this, all of this needs to be delivered through the models that we talked about earlier. And these are the goals that you need to align for. And I think uh, Atul spoke, Atul and uh, Ganesh both spoke about this earlier. These are the metrics that you have to define upfront to make sure that the small pilots that you're doing or the big digital transformations that you're embarking upon, they are broken into milestones. You have the right things to, uh, to measure. Uh, and then you're staying true to those deliverables as you scale up, as you as you grow, on, and, and as you realize the kind of impacts that you that you are trying to. Uh, this is a, a, a illustrative example of uh, what we do with some of the organizations on uh, on how do you define your goal, how do you look at the opportunities, and then what are the key enablers. And you know, again, we don't have to go through the full slide, but a couple of things that uh, kind of uh, jump out is when you think again from a customer standpoint, when you think about how do you drive patient outcome or HCP outcomes? How do you make sure that your channels are not getting saturated? Uh, today, I think an HCP gets 3x the number of touch point, digital touch points that they used to get pre-COVID. Uh, and every organization wants to make sure that their message reaches first. So how do you make sure that you don't get lost in the clutter? Uh, there are multiple answers to that. There's no one answer. There are multiple answers. Uh, the answer could be one, as I was saying earlier, integrating the journey, making sure that each channel builds on top of the other versus trying to be a standalone channel. How do you hyper-localize? How do you hyper-personalize the content? Uh, and, and unless you do that, uh, the chances of the message being lost to the clutter uh, becomes extremely, extremely high. Right? How do you make sure that you are increasing your reach? Uh, how do you make sure that you're not still, uh, as a, again, as a, as a marketer, when I start thinking about it, I know the channel effectiveness of some of the channels is lower then uh, let's say a rep going to meet a customer. So how do I get the same impact? And the only answer that jumps to me is effectively we increase your reach. Right? So how do you have the right databases? How do you use the analytics to make sure that uh, your, your message is getting effectively used? Right? And in the end, all of this is, is gonna be difficult for you to get to unless there is a trust that you build with in the relationship. And that trust gets built not by promoting a product, but by understanding what the HCP is looking at, uh, giving them what they need in terms of knowledge and support um, that some of the organizations are doing by connecting them to the right patients, by giving them the right, right nuggets, of, nuggets of knowledge and, and improving their experience and helping them do their job even in this tougher time. Right? With that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, I'll close my uh, topic here. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. So I hope that we come out of this stronger. Uh, I don't think digital is going to go away, but I hope we learn how to leverage digital and this technology to the best of our advantage going forward. Thank you very much. And yes. thanks for the time. Thank you so much, Marut, for being here and sharing your insights. So uh, we'll to quickly take a question. If any, please, you can raise your hands or put in your chat box. So uh, Marut is here. He can answer your questions. We'll wait for a while. Any questions? Uh, you guys can raise your hands. A bit of too intuitive. Uh, so I'm happy to you know, connect offline, but- Yeah, uh, so uh, we have a panel, maybe the questions might come in and you can be answering on the chat box. So that would be great, yeah? Sure. So thank you uh, once again. Much. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so thank you once again uh, for being here, Marut, and sharing your insights. Now, uh, moving to our last and very interesting uh, session, uh, one of the, that's a panel discussion, which is on the topic of future of Indian pharmaceutical industry, a post-COVID outlook. So first I would start introducing our panel speakers. Uh, introducing uh, Dr. Abdul Para. He's a global CIO with Vocard Limited, a business visionary and 
with deep insights with vast of 24 years in IT uh, strategies, implementing digital technology, cybersecurity, industry specific regulatory and statutory compliance leading to technology and business alignment. Has successfully led many initiatives of change management, transformation, project across global locations, multi-country and multi-currency. So am I audible? Am I breaking? If somebody can just let me know. Was I breaking? No, it's all clear. Okay, thank you, thank you. Introducing our next speaker, uh, Mr. Webhav Rao, is a Pfizer Asia Digital Client Partner and has been with the organization for over nine years. He has played several key roles in the organizations, digitally transforming both Pfizer Innovative as well as established biopharma businesses in the region. Webo is focused on driving digital innovation in the region with measurable businesses outcomes. Our next speaker, Dheeraj Gautam, he leads the digital innovation for Dr. Reddy's emerging markets. He is leading critical initiative focusing on HCPs and patients. He comes from the product management, online marketing and entrepreneurship background. We have Mr. Inkesha. He's an Associate Director of Digital Marketing with CIPLA. He is also a health tech startup consultant and digital transformation strategist. He has driven digital transformation for pharma companies and healthcare startups. We have Shweta Saide, Director of Business Development and Marketing in DG. She has 15 plus years of experience as business leader with a demonstrated history of working in healthcare industry and cross-border business development passionate about healthcare goods, services, and platforms to create a sustained and well-founded future for the globe. Now inviting our moderator for the day, Barkha Agarwal. Barkha Agarwal is an associate director from Novartis, having close to 17 years of experience in IT and digital technology area. She has worked on multiple domains like banking, automobile, pharma, and healthcare, and executed digital transformation projects for these domains currently working with Novartis as a technical design expert for regulatory affairs, function, and driving projects on automation, advanced analytics, and AI. Over to you, Barkha, to moderate the panel. Thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you, Ekta. Uh, hello, everyone. So as we have already heard from Atul, uh, Ganesh, and Marut, uh, that the digital technology has considerably changed the way new drugs are developed, evolutionary algorithm, neural networks, NLPs, machine learning, variables, IoT devices, optimize different workflow in pharma industries. Automating the previously routine and manual tasks are considerably speeding up the drug development process. So I would like to initiate this panel discussion uh, with this topic and uh, would request Babha to share his thoughts on how technology acts as an important driver in the growth of the pharma industry. Right, thank you. Uh, am I audible, uh, everyone? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Barkha and Ikta and um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys are at home and staying safe. So continue to do that. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, Barkha, I think that's a very interesting topic, right? So I think technology and digital are both driving uh, the pharma uh, industry ahead in many ways. And uh, having spent more than 16 years in digital and technology and also 10 plus years in the pharma uh, domain, I can, you know, uh, say that there is there are so many aspects uh, where uh, digital and technology is playing and, you know, uh, impacting. So, from a pharma organization perspective, as you look out, right? So you, look, what are who are key important stakeholders typically, right? From from a, from healthcare professionals to patients to even insurance companies to um, pharmacies, distributors, all of them. So you see digital uh, uh, having a ha having an impact. Uh, on, on the on them and also when you look inwards uh, within the organization you get field force colleagues right who are actually meeting our, our uh, main stakeholders on the ground they have uh, uh, been impacted from uh, that there's an impact on them uh, not only that not only limited to that but even from r d uh, clinical trials distribution supply manufacturing all of that uh, has uh, you know digital and technology has touched upon them and Again, um, just to, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, technology being a driver, what do you exactly mean? And what do you, or when you talk about impact, what do you exactly mean? It's about measuring these impacts, right? So it's all about that. So technology and digital helps us actually measure the impact or the outcomes that we, I'm a big believer and extremely passionate about measuring these uh, uh, outcomes when we implement any, any technology or any digital tool for that matter to help uh, any, uh, any of these aspects that I just uh, spoke about. So I won't get into um, 
uh, uh, into a lot of uh, uh, strategic talk, but I would, you know, there was a request that there'll be more examples. So it's better that if it's shared with the panel and even with the with the audiences who are joining. So, uh, just you know, I, I think uh, our, our speakers in the beginning also alluded to that. Uh, our, you know, the, the life of a field colleague and our, our doctors, how how technology has actually impacted uh, and actually made their lives easy. So ten years ago, when I actually joined, uh, you know, kind of moved into a pharma from a consulting practice, uh, mainstream pharma from a technology and digital perspective, I did a lot of field trips just to understand my customers, right? And I still do continue uh, uh, before the pandemic, and I will in in the future as well. But uh, interesting to see, right? Our field colleagues used to stand outside doctors' chambers holding three to four kilograms of, uh, you know, paper-based visual aids. Those were the days. And when the interaction would, used to happen inside the clinic, it was pretty much limited between those two individuals and whatever insights we were getting out of it were very subjective. Our uh, marketers would take almost six months to churn a new visual aid, we'll print it out and distribute that. Those were the days. Now, fast forward 10 years. Now we are looking at our pharma uh, field colleagues just retailing out of an iPad or a, or a tab, which has a sophisticated CRM and a CLM tool which gives us real time insights in terms of you know the brand messaging which has been kind of, if, if the scientific differentiation being conveyed to the doctor what uh, product makes more sense to be detailed first and, and the, uh, what should be detailed later in, in what order right so these are real time insights which we're getting which is particularly pertaining to an interaction which is happening with uh, uh, within a, within a chamber and more so now it's it's even done remotely so with with covid right so the, the doctors are actually contacting our our field colleagues and having these conversations uh, uh, remotely where the detailing is happening so the fact of the matter is again you, due to these insights being collected real time and the clm in place our marketers are actually able to decide and churn out these you know detailers even uh, within within a couple of weeks as opposed to six months in the past so and the next interaction which which happens with the with the with the physician or a hcp is more important right it's depending on the feedback which you actually collected during this interaction so that's how you see uh, uh, the the scale moving. And again, I'm talking about measurable impacts, which wasn't the case earlier. Uh, and uh, you see those you know those those conversations improving one uh, one you know one call after the other because of these changes that uh, we are able to make from the back end. Um, having you know staying with our uh, uh, with our HCPs, right? We've seen um, our HCPs are they are they are social social beings like us. They do. Uh, uh, visit a, a lot of social media sites and there is an also walled garden uh, website which are you know hcp online communities basically where there is uh, where they actually visit to consume a lot of information related to scientific information or you know, discuss uh, patient case studies consume uh, uh, knowledge uh, from med journals uh, watch uh, webinars from pharma or even uh, you know some other sponsored uh, avenues and also um, you know uh, do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer connect and KOL connect, which is the networking bit. So it becomes a one-stop shop solution. These are not open to internet channels, but are available there. So think about what we were doing earlier. Like five years ago, we were actually creating uh, sites for HCPs, uh, uh, pharma-sponsored websites, or maybe sending out emails, but that had limited amount of uh, uh, touch points or interactions. Our, our, we've seen that there's a shift from, uh, from, our, uh, from our HCPs who are actually moving on to these third-party platforms where they get a lot of a uh, lot of material a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, material form from a from a professional perspective that they want to be in it's like a linkedin for doctors but un under under uh, um, under a password or a, or a login right so not open to the internet but these pharma uh, these uh, third party online communities are now open to uh, collaborating with pharmas so because and they with using you know advanced ai and ml they are actually able to segment the doctors and profile them and based on their digital behavior and uh, uh, and or what they're doing on their websites, even on their platform, also offside of their platform. So, um, and 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 for example, like a cardiologist who's based in Mumbai who's visiting uh, this website uh, or this third-party online community would be packaged and served a content which is most which is he most likely to click. And this is based on the insights which were collected early on, right, uh, on his digital behaviors uh, on the website as, as well. His areas of interest, his specialty, all of that goes into serving that content, which has which 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 has higher propensity for him to click and consume. Mm -hmm. So from a pharma perspective, it makes so much more sense to actually, you know, partner strategically with the with them 
rather than going after an RHCP through emails or even you know expecting them to uh, magically come to our website and consume content. So um, it helps you know again from talking from an impact perspective uh, uh, or the outcomes perspective, there is a larger value for the media buck that you spend these days. While you have uh, while while you increase the engagement with our HCPs for the same content which you create, right? So uh, these are avenues. Uh, it's only possible uh, and through 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 digital, which is actually driving this. So um, you know, and now let's shift our attention to to patients, right? So that's also interesting. Now, our earlier on, we used to like depend again upon creating some websites for creating awareness about our patients, uh, for for uh, for uh, related to their healthcare and well-being. Um, that's what we do and probably leave some leave behind literature or a, a poster on the wall in a clinic or a hospital explaining them about you know what they should do about if they have some some condition now um, our patients also have moved digitally into so many areas right on on social media and plus one interesting thing i would like to bring out is the emergence of e-pharmacy channels a lot of patients go there to buy their medicines uh, but in the last Two or three years, I've seen these business models really change. Now, e-pharmacies are not longer, no longer only e-pharmacies where they offer discounted priced medicines, but they are also offering a myriad of other services. For example, like your, you can actually uh, uh, get in touch with a dietitian who will follow. Uh, who you can actually uh, avail care at home services. Uh, so they run a uh, patient care program on behalf of pharma companies, these e-pharmacies. So, uh, it, it, and, and uh, it's unbelievable. So we can have order for diagnostic services as well at home. So these are additional services which actually glue the patient onto their platform and don't let them go. But in doing so, the patient is depositing so much of digital information with them. So they are able to, again, um, profile them better so that when we want to actually go and meet our patients and give them content which will help them drive better health outcomes, this is the place to be. And again, similar to what I explained with, with what we're doing with HCPs, this is, again, helping drive better uh, reach and uh, engagement with the right audience that we want to go rather than then spraying and praying, which we were probably earlier on doing when we were learning how to actually digitize in pharma. Um, and again, uh, these e-pharmacies also translated into uh, 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 telehealth or telemedicine um, uh, companies as well, where they're able to connect uh, uh, a patient red, uh, on, in, in real time with a doctor and actually help them um, you know, with, with their needs. And we've seen this uh, grow a lot on exponentially, almost 500% in the last 18 months with the, uh, uh, once COVID actually hit us. So um, this is again uh, digital, which is actually dri uh, driving this and impacting. And one last thought, which is again uh, part of the emerging uh, space in, in the patient care is the, the emergence of companion apps or digital therapeutics. Now, this is interesting because uh, it's no longer an app for to which gives you a pill reminder, but extremely highly personalized to drive health outcomes for the patient. For example, a diabetic patient with having some ex glycemic value would be assigned a health coach, which will which would be a bot, which will be driven by AI or ML, which will tell how many steps that the patient should take depending on the last glycemic index or the average that they've been depositing on this extremely personalized between the two patients and uh, or a diet plan or when do they should you know take the blood test or even meet their diabetologist. It's all automated on this on one single app. Um, in in fact, some apps also allow you when you click a photo of a food item that you want to eat, it will tell you how many calories that you can consume. So if you're a diabetic, you should know what you're going to intake. So if you are adherent to something like this, there is an outcome, a real world outcome that you can see that your glycemic uh, index reduces over a period of months. So this has been scientifically proven that, uh, you know, you can actually have a companion app like this, which which will help you reduce uh, uh, basically the, the, your glycemic index. So this is something where a pharma company or even uh, healthcare governments are interested in partnering to drive better public health outcomes. Uh, this is again an avenue which, which, which has a measurable impact uh, uh, that, can, that we can see. Uh, on 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 people. So countries emerge, you know, developed countries like Germany are actually legalizing the doctors to actually prescribe a companion app to a patient. So that's the level which we are actually digi the digital and technology is moving at that pace. Um, and so, uh, and mostly it's for chronic care and mental uh, wellness. But I'm sure it will expand to other areas as well in the, uh, with, with the advancement and adoption of uh, digital for patient care. So um, uh, I, I can go on for a day on, on this topic, but for now I'll, I'll, I'll take a pause, but just want to conclude that, uh, you know, from a, from a digital and technology being a driver in healthcare, I think the most important thing it does, it helps to measure an outcome that we are going after and uh, helps us uh, 
makes us keeps us nimble on the feet to to change and and deliver better every time that we touch upon our important stakeholders outside so so that's what i i can pull on that but uh, thank you again for this opportunity and i love to listen from others as well thank you uh, very well said uh, vabo so uh, you as you mentioned like 10 years back uh, we were all paper based and how we moved from paper based to digital so it's like moving from bricks to click uh, uh, yep. talking in terms of exactly right. what atul has mentioned so it is the, the so the examples you gave it gives a very good brief on how the advances in digital technologies have accelerated drug discovery to streamline the clinical trials these drug drug commercialization and also improve the drug safety so okay. to post 19 impact uh, in the bone fire of destruction across india triggered at the pandemic uh, the latest of the pharma industry can hardly escape the impact so it may seem that the pharma sector uh, set to benefit a lot but uh, still uh, uh, if you see about the uh, see the industries where it's uh, uh, they're not uh, really uh, developing the vaccine or developing the ppe kits uh, it it they were impacted a lot so the lockdown has had a significant impact on the sector routine treatments have been postponed while health budgets already under strain they have been further stressed due to the sudden surge in the pandemic related cost drug trials for non covid related treatments on hold and supply chain issues have impacted medicines and devices in production so dr adwait please share your thoughts on how do you see the impact of covid 19 in pharma industry and do you think this impact will create a need to accelerate the digital transformation in pharma industry uh dr adwait if you can you hear okay okay sorry i think a lot has been said uh, in in starting even vivo has added more uh, one of the important part which we should uh, know that everyone has reacted to the digital transformation then the uh, preparedness so when you react uh, no none of us know that uh, whether we are as an organization we are prepared to take this shock and get aligned quickly because Uh, there was a era of electronic system where uh, the data collection was uh, uh, more uh, uh, priority so that we get the, everything into electronic form and then uh, we, we can always draw the reports uh, the the situation at this uh, is uh, everybody is becoming a follower now uh, we are just following uh, whether it is telemedicine whether it is customer engagement when in pharma you have two types of customer whether the distributor or a doctor you can't you know ignore any one of them doctor of course uh, raises creates a prescription for you and then demand is fulfilled by this so with with too many things happening i think if one of the area which we need to uh, take it on a priority is how do you educate or how do you upskill your internal uh culture to accept this digital because it's a deluge of uh, uh, tools technology avenues options uh, solutions which are available but if you look at it uh, maybe we within the organization uh, we are creating so many analytics but are we really making use of it are the decisions really happening on that so that's one of the concern uh we uh, having said this none of the company or including wohard we are all uh, ensuring that we are uh, we have become a digital friendly and while you are digital friendly one of the most important part we should know is how do you uh, personalize the things otherwise if you start giving uh, one uh, you know one of one kind of plate to everyone it may not work so post covid what is, what has happened is everyone is trying to find out how can i understand customer better so uh, and then what uh, the focus is uh, the the getting the insights so it it is a, a uh, it's a true triangle between a uh, uh, customer internal organization and a technology so this is the triangle which is uh, more uh, uh, getting explored now uh, we we have a technology i think every company has gone and opted uh, whether it is ecosystem integration whether it is uh earlier what was happening is uh, before covid uh, the uh, the medical rep was closest to customer and all the whether it's office people they were far off from they were only perceiving but now everybody can understand customer whether you sitting in corporate you sitting in uh, uh, your zonal office or some kind of headquarters 
you have a data there is a huge data is there so you can understand customers in a 360 day degree but so that that's a biggest advantage which i think uh, we have it and how do i how do we really uh, you, uh, you know use this model for customer experience you know, better service offering i think that's the two areas which can come out uh, whether you talk about uh, net promoter score or you talk about different kind of analytics which we are today drawing out and you know, we are correlating the most important part is we started correlating different variables which otherwise had no relevance when it was uh, it was dealt by the reps so uh, we the, the if you see this year the most important part of digital is is analytics we are moving from descriptive to predictive and i'm sure come couple of years every in every area whatever we do we will be talking about predictive language and no longer rows or columns or the fancy dashboards it's no longer it's going to be so this is a shift which we are seeing it uh to summarize we need to uh, the the three shifts which are happening uh, every company started understanding customer better uh, through various kind of uh, ways and means going closer to the customer uh, and it's no longer uh, uh, a person who is close to customer understand the customer now but the people who are also seeing the data they can understand and organization has also understood uh, to absorb this kind of uh, you know digital transformation your internal culture which is mindset people set and tools care tool tool set needs to get uh, uh, overlay on people process technology so that's the change completely agree uh, dr rajit what you said uh, so uh, companies looking to rebound quickly after the pandemic uh, need to consider how the digital and data analytics tools can be deployed in every area of their business and it is very important that the internal uh, team um uh, should be ready for that they should be ready to accept that so like for example the machine learning can automate many processes in drug development cycle by utilizing large amount of data but again um the people who would be running that or who who, who are already working uh, on that manually they should be completely aware and agreed and ready to utilize that what uh, the technology is providing and uh, as you said uh, the and understanding the customer better that that is the key so that led me to another interesting question on the involvement of the healthcare provider uh, marut has also touched upon the customer engagement plan and hcp's certification on the engagement uh, the engagement of the hcp is a key pointer here for the betterment of patients and making sure that pharma product and services reaching the patient much faster uh, Shweta, uh, please share your point of view on how technology can help engaging with HCP in a much better and faster manner, and how that can be applied during post-pandemic era. Um, thanks, Marka. Uh, I think due to the ongoing pandemic, one thing that has clearly emerged is that HCPs have started relying more on digital channels. Right. Uh, one because people and sales reps are not able to go and meet the doctors or any of the etc so the digital engagement has been through either emails telecalls uh, or some kind of a webinars but both uh, marut and danya spoke about the webinar fatigue etc i think that's where we need to make a clear differentiation about what are we trying to do with the etc right from a pharma company perspective uh, what is important is not just reaching out to the etcs but it's about actually engaging with them and how do we engage the uh, etcs and here is where digital plays a extremely important role because this helps us identify the customer journey through a very insight and data driven approach right we the engagement through hcps is much better when we understand what is it that the, our customers need what does the hcp need today uh, where are they pro, available online right does a simple email work it doesn't any longer right every pharma company is sending them emails so there is a clear need to differentiate between the different providers and this is where the insight and data comes in and also the need to be agile uh, if you look at the earlier models where uh, the reps were going out and you know uh, leaving behind retailers or as by the way putting up posters etc the time taken to become agile to understand that the hcp is not really valuing this information was much longer right but with a digital uh, implementation 
faster to actually change the way we are implementing it. Look at different channels where we can actually implement or even the content that is given to the HCPs. Uh, to just focus a little more on the engagement piece, right? Because uh, as I said, all pharma companies are right now talking about how do we digitally reach out or engage with uh, HCPs. But I think we need, and Marut specified this before also about talking about an omni-channel experience, right? We have to look at ways where HCPs say are getting an email, but what does it lead to? What is the value that particular email is providing to them? Uh, the email has to be linked to some kind of a call to action where the HCP goes and he gets some value add through a webinar, through a clinical study or a journal. The HCPs are also looking out to the pharma companies right now to expand their thinking, to provide them more knowledge. And with the technology that is available, it could be through webinars, CMEs, journals. There, is, there are lots of opportunities to which we can actually provide, right? We have to use this, uh, how do you call it? Yeah, I think we should say that you have to use this opportunity right now uh, to spend the next couple of months for every pharma company to use their digital technology to understand who are their right customers, right? What is the right channel to go to these customers? What is the right time to actually message to them? And then spend after that to actually nurturing these customers, right? Uh, and also providing them more information on diseases and the molecules then talking about the product, right? When we use channels to actually talk about products, that's not really uh, elevating the customer. It is, it's not uh, giving the HCP more to talk about or service their patients better. So I think the way we've been talking to HCPs, that needs to be changed. And uh, that's where digital helps because it's an extremely agile model and we could do it much sooner and reach a customer in a faster manner, in a more uh, tailored solution is what we can actually provide to the customers. Right now. Agreed, uh, Shweta. So uh, it, it's not about just the engagement of HCPs. It should be a valuable engagement so that uh, whatever way we are engaging, we may use a lot of technologies, but if... Uh, the value is not getting added, it uh, it could not be helpful. Uh, maybe can I add an example here? So uh, we have seen or actually seeing an official shortage of some of the drugs during COVID-19, which uh, were tested as possible remedies for coronavirus, like hydrochloroquine, remdesivir, febiflu, although most of them are not uh, valid uh, as per the latest news, but we had a, a shortage uh, maybe a few days back. So if the pharma manufacturers, suppliers, HCPs, would have been connected well digitally earlier, these highest demanded drugs would have been manufactured much faster when the patients actually needed them more. So I think, uh, yeah, completely agree. We need to find out ways uh, uh, to utilize these digital technologies so that the valuable connection may ha should happen. Uh, so just, just coming to the other point, uh, so we, we have been talking about all these digital transformation and uh, how to do, what to do, uh, and uh, uh, Ganesh also touched upon that point. Most of these digitization concepts evolves around data, whether we write an algorithm to predict an outcome or clinical results based on structured and unstructured data, or we use electronic health records to pre-processing the information. We have a lot of data dependencies. And, but when we talk about data, this leads to the security concerns. So for that, we have strong laws and policies, which sometimes become hindrance for our digital initiatives. Dheeraj, what do you think these laws are deterrent or enablers for the pharma companies? Hi, Barkha. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much, everyone. And uh, a small story uh, before I begin. So in 2011, uh, uh, sorry, 2010, almost 11 years back when I joined uh, as a brand manager, fresh out of an MBA college, joined as a brand manager for HIV uh, drugs, which are ARV FTFs. So when I started going to doctors and understanding the patients, I understood that you know a very big challenge is the adherence. So if the patients, even though at that point of time, this, the first line 
therapy was still zidovudine and emtricitabine so it was not uh, you know very much tenofovir was not uh, not not a lot in, lot in use uh, tenofovir is a very simple regime you know it's one tablet a day so that's why the adherence uh, within the hiv patients was was a big problem so i went to my uh, manager and then you know we ultimately went to uh, the um, uh, medico legal and compliance guys and told them that we want to actually have a paper based solution where we will you know take a patient's um, uh, adherence data and then predict which patient is going to default and give it you know give this data to um, uh, the doctor so we were straight away uh, this idea was straight away rejected uh, because um because you know pharma companies can never have uh, patients pii and phi and uh, my compliance guys were not convinced that you know there will not be any misuse of the paper based uh, phi and pii so one innovation which actually uh, uh, was uh, died uh, short Uh, so i i would like to actually ask everyone present here who thinks that you know pharma companies cannot have access to phi and pii of uh, patients in please use your chat and just say why or no within next 2 minutes let me uh, just check you know how many of us if we have a common answer to this uh, problem if you think that you know pharma companies can have access to phi and pii of a patient phi is uh, health information and pii is identifiable information of a patient please say yes if you feel that you know no we cannot have it because we are a pharma company you know law says this then just say no no okay i've got one yes so webber and dr abdul shweta barkha what do you think ekta Uh, maybe for uh, my thoughts would be you pharma companies may need it but uh, i don't think uh, pharma companies are allowed to have it yeah yes yes so that same you know i'm getting yeah. the mixed response here which says yes yes no no and you know if you go after this uh, workshop after this uh, discussion please go and you know try to check try to google if pharma companies can have it you will not get a clear answer and this is this is not a problem in india this we have i've seen this problem in latin america uh, you know uh, i work with uh, our colombia counterparts uh, brazil counterparts uh, you know southeast asia south africa we are trying to do a lot of patient focused interventions there and the first resistance that we get is that you know you are a pharma company we don't even want to talk to you if if you are a hospital this is the first thing that they'll say we are a pharma company you want to do something you want to do some innovation uh, uh, with patients and you will have access to phi and pii we don't want to work with you and it takes a lot of uh, it's not that you know we are not able to convince them yes there are you know there there is technology uh, barriers available you know you can have physical separation you can have logical separation multi tenancy there are a lot of things that you can do Uh, but then there is what is missing is that clear guideline i cannot you know i cannot produce a paper saying that hey this is this is allowed you know this is uh, if if i can ensure the security security and privacy of the data and if my patient and my hcps are actually consenting to share that data with me it is allowed but there is no paper there is no guideline there is no no law even if you look at hipaa compliance a hipa compliance is the compliance if you want to you know webber was uh, mentioning digital therapeutics you know uh, if you want to do any kind of online uh, application based uh, intervention hipa is the compliance hipa doesn't say anything about pharma company uh, 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 you know can access phi or pii no there is no guideline so my uh, you know this is what this is the hindrance that we get and you know now uh, although you know this is this doesn't become a challenge you know it's actually just a little inconvenience if we are trying to do some basic innovation like you know um, a patient is uh, as webber was also again pointing out uh, glycemic index is so and so you know then connect this patient to a particular uh, coach uh, which is a basic uh, innovation we can still do it you know there are tools uh, which can hide the information and then rules engine can run but then if you are actually looking at uh, very you know very serious therapies like cancer 
uh, and then you know uh, uh, or maybe patients who are there in icu and you and the digital innovation that requires you to actually kind of maintain a digital twin which means that you know a data stream has to come and then essentially you will have to identify the patient for which you want to actually improve the outcome in those cases it becomes really 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 difficult for pharma companies to actually you know be able to add value there i'll give you one incidence now we um, uh, we are uh, you know piloting with some patient uh, specific innovations in colombia brazil uh, even in south africa it becomes really difficult for us to actually you know create a meaningful analytic system uh, which as dr avdoot was also pointing out that you know basic basic everything else has become very hygiene you know now you have prescriptive uh, analytics you have dashboards uh, you have descriptive analytics but then if i want to build a data stream which is which you know necessitates me to actually identify a uh, a patient and then in real time provide hyper personalization to this patient in the that case you know we have we are having a very tough time and we have to actually implement a lot of creative problem solving to actually establish uh, implement a simple cdp which is which is not a big challenge you know if you want if you want to integrate a cdp in your applications say a segment or an m particle you can just you know there is a code snippet which is available just go and uh, Switch it with your app, digital applications, but here because of this restriction and and uh, you know what is what is funny is that actually none of us uh, most of us know that you know this can be done, but none of us can convince them. So uh, there has to be clear guideline uh, which say that you know pharma companies can yes or no cannot have PHI or PII or you know for example data privacy laws are very very clear. in every country you know there are uh, can, can you exchange data can you transfer data all of those data laws are very very clear across international boundaries but then again phi pii and pharmaceutical uh, companies how the interplay has to happen and what kind of security systems data privacy consent system you need to have in place that is very unclear i would like to take uh, reference from um from another field which is banking uh you know how are we able to go and you know go to one bank atm and withdraw uh, money from my account which is which is not even in this bank you know it is in another bank so this kind of interoperability will not be possible actually even if all the pharma companies come together we will not be able to create this interoperability in a feasible financially feasible way until unless government actually at the policy level we have an organization working like ncpi uh, is working in terms of uh, banking and payments in india and you know having said that india has the most advanced banking and uh, payment system in the world because of ncpi ncpi is a government body Uh, and actually has created this entire technology ecosystem where all the banks can then just plug in their uh, uh, crm systems and then interplay between the banks happen a patient in a non insurance market like india has to frequently change doctor from one doctor to another doctor from one hospital to another hospital and then you know it becomes a nightmare nightmare i am not able to actually go to you know one hospital and Uh, be able to produce all of my medical history and say that you know in last one year this is this has been my medical history and now because i changed my hospital i have to you know most of the times they also ask me to repeat all the tests which are uh, done so that this interoperability there are some standards fhir is there you know then icd 10 standards are there but then nothing substantial has yet been done to actually put a structure Uh, which can uh, which at a higher order actually uh, you know uh, makes everything work together so i think uh, i have actually uh, given a lot of problems but uh, maybe the solution is to at least you know think about it talk about it you know all the pharma companies for come together you know do something which we can do in our private uh, 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 you know ownership uh, and uh, entitlement and then maybe you know at at some point of time we'll be able to influence at the policy level also you know uh, what kind of um, country level 
laws, uh, guidelines, and clear uh, systems can be created. Maybe we can start from uh, a discussion like this. Um, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic. Thanks, Siraj. Uh, can't I agree more uh, on this. So we need really need an interconnected database for patients. So uh, I, even I have faced that you go from one doctor to another and everything is lost. You have to carry yes. all the physical documents. And it's not only limited to here. There are many, many other things where we are lagging. But specifically in pharma industry, I think the industry is still lagging uh, behind a lot in terms of the transformation. And there is a lot could be discovered to be done. And uh, but uh, but we still see, I mean, there, there have been many things which have been done and we see digitally aware patients are becoming more engaged and active in determining their own health outcome. That, that's a good sign. Uh, so HCP pharma company service providers are seeking to integrate and align data for a broader end-to-end -end view for, from diagnosis to treatment. So that, that is what everyone is looking for and seeking for. So in, the, in this emerging healthcare ecosystem value proposition, we'll focus on delivering outcome-based health and digital enablement. So maybe I would like to ask uh, Rinkesh to share your, your thoughts, Rinkesh, on pharma industry working on reshaping this uh, value proposition. Yeah, hi, hi uh, Barkha, thanks for that question. Uh, so I'll keep it short. I think uh, uh, so pharma delivering to its expectation is a is a task which is ongoing uh, but i think one of the biggest change which we are seeing in the western world and i think it will soon uh, kind of bring it up in india as well and i think what atul mentioned in his initial conversation is about uh, value based care or an outcome based care uh, where the focus is going so it's not anymore about uh, about taking a medicine it's about which uh, vital health parameter is kind of uh, getting better with that medicine i think uh, and the entire insurance sector is kind of moving towards it right so i think uh, the sooner we start defining that as a pharma company i think we i think you know historically we have been owning up the aspect of either uh, bringing up new products or delivering new information right to the to the healthcare uh, practice so i think it's a time where pharma kind of contributes itself into delivering onto what uh, healthcare parameters which we can focus on uh, for value-based care uh, three things i think which we need to change uh, for that one is again what atul spoke about is what's between our ears is a problem is the, is the mindset which is a problem um, so, so having a tech mindset uh, which means that having a kpi based mindset which also means that uh, we should not do things uh, for short term, focus on more long term uh, sustainable uh, uh, KPIs which we can deliver on. Uh, I think that mindset needs to come in. Uh, the other thing is use case based approach. So we talk, I think Marut talked about a lot about uh, channels, content uh, and all of it. But I think one important point and one very crucial aspect on which the entire uh, tech transformation kind of kind of is built across industries across startup world everywhere is a use case based approach right you see a use case of a self driving car which drives an industry you see a use case of uh, having a access easy access to video based content and that's where the that's how the industry is driven then uh, and in in one of the maru slides we saw that you know uh, uh, he mentioned about ease of access to content is not there uh, for the doctors and doctors are saying that. So can we solve for that use case? I think in the industry, in the companies, we don't talk about use case based approach. We still talk about a product based approach. I think that's where you are not able to aggregate customer at one place. You are not able to access them easily. Uh, and in the transformation and Ekta to, you and, and Barakha to your question, which you have been asked, which you have asked, I think, uh, it's for all of us who are over here on this panel, I think, uh, you know, we have got this opportunity of, of saying that we are tech, uh, we are uh, one of the tech mindsets in the industry. But I think we, as a, we are a mindset, but I think we don't own a business outcomes, right? So as, a, as, as individuals, as the team, uh, digital transformation or digital marketing teams, or tech teams, I think we need to own a business, right? So we need to build a use case where we show clear outcomes 
in in positive business impacts and that's the only way where where the where the first point of mindset change can be achieved so if we ourselves cannot deliver on business outcomes on a small or large use cases i think there is no point in talking about it right so i think as it's and it's our ownership that we take up such a uh, such outcome based uh, task deliver on it so that we can drive the tech mindset i think so pharma needs to overall kind of uh, start looking at more of outcome based shifts and look at either tech mindset change use case based approach or digital team uh, owning up numbers in some way or the other uh, i think that's how the transformation could be driven thanks ankesh uh, i completely agree with what you said on the use case based approach so although we have a lot more innovations happening across industry still pharma companies are lagging behind in digital trans- transformation primarily because struggle to define a clear business case for the technology changes so th- that is i think the major issue but if we see still uh, we have the pressure the pressure is rising pressure to accelerate innovation pressure to optimize production pressure to comply with regulation in a world of both big data and big concern about the data integrity so with this rising pressure maybe we will have a quick uh, round the table 30 seconds uh, quick answer uh, what do you think uh, if uh, i mean do you think we are really ready for the digital transformation and uh, what does the next decade look like for you so we start with dheeraj Oh yeah, absolutely. Actually, even uh, with the pandemic, actually this is one good thing which has come. You know, digital uh, transformation acceleration has happened, and a lot of capability building is happening within all pharma companies also. And uh, with this, uh, I think a lot of technology art, uh, infrastructure like uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, but <laughs> a lot of technology, uh, uh, you know, the backbone and uh, Uh, technology architecture is going to come up which on which we will be able to piggy back and do a lot of innovation and it is going to actually uh, go into all fields of uh, pharma not only at cp engagement and patient engagement but even new drug uh, discovery um, and uh, i think uh, now in next 10 years you are going to see uh, the new gen uh, pharma companies uh, the existing ones who are very adaptable to change are going to transform into new gen pharma companies and then we will also see a uh, growth of new startup based pharma companies who are you know only uh, dependent on data and are still able to actually do uh, new drug discovery so i think this the next 10 years are going to be very very exciting uh, don't change your sector be in healthcare <laughs> so i'm um, uh, i think i need we need to wrap up so let's uh, hear uh, two cents from shweta and probably we can wrap this up so shweta your two cents uh, quick 30 seconds thought on this So I agree with Deeraj, right? I think so. As unfortunate as the entire pandemic is, this was a shift that was being expected uh, to happen probably in the course of next ten years or something. But because of the pandemic, uh, all the entire sector is rushing to digitally enable themselves. What we are seeing right now is how do we provide those technologies for better patient care and for HCP engagement? I think as the next couple of years go, we'll see it across various. Uh, functions and uh, as well not uh, as uh, dheeraj already said it's not just drug discovery but we will start seeing it in different functions within the companies as well right from you know supply chain to uh, distribution and ganesh touched upon it as well uh, but these are still which are being uh, worked on and i think this will something that we will see uh, happen in the next few years and uh, yeah let's just hope that uh, we accelerate digitally but the pandemic goes away soon because that should be the hope for us and we do better but the situation should also come better yeah any any last thought dr parab or debo uh, i think uh, our industry uh, we were known for more of a generic industry which probably uh, in in coming few years it may not be a just a generic we we have already entered into new chemical entities as innovative drug which is going to be a next leap and a vaccine centric one so this these are the two things which is having said this um, digital workers are already in the system now so uh, there are some roles we might even say medical rep role completely go away we don't know 
so digital uh, digital wraps are already in uh, in the system now so uh, we will see more and more digital assistants which will uh, take over and it will be a very much connected world uh, everything man material environment everything will be connected so uh, we will see a different uh, way of working uh, adapting uh, i think the foundation of that is already been put to we we have experienced the work from home we don't know whether even offices will be there or not so it's going to be a completely a different uh, manufacturing so will be connected so we talk about uh, we will be talking every re remote as a service uh, going forward yeah so uh, i think just to summarize uh, only the most agile and responsive will find success in this healthcare uh, ecosystem in part of building and value enabling partnership and the pharma industries will need to take some well thought out risk uh, and embrace their right opportunity and importantly fire on all cylinders so uh, probably one solution to reduce risk to optimize the potential of digital technologies to help indian pharma companies improve the efficiency and effectiveness of their drug development process from discovery through clinical trial to regulatory process making the whole process faster and cheaper than what it is currently um i think uh, um, we are good now um ekta i'm not sure if you have time to open it up for the questions yes uh, no, so uh, we can quickly take one questions if we have and then we wrap up yeah so audiences any questions with the panelist uh, that would be great i think we had uh, one questions actually two questions one was from shubhi kotia that was an open question to the panel what is the trend uh, in you you are seeing in terms of internal cross functional acceptance approval speed and uh, there go to the market speed of digital solutions so any one of uh, if you can take it forward so let me take this uh, ekta from yeah. uh, working with i mean we work with almost the top 18 pharma companies in the world and uh, we obviously work with some of the most uh, some, of, some of the biggest pharma clients in this country as well and we have seen that there is a lot of opportunity as far as digitization is concerned and more importantly than opportunity it is the willingness of the people in these organizations to adopt it right uh, they are the ones who even when we propose a solution now they come back and they actually ask us say hey you know this person from another team from different function all together wanted to know can we do something about it and so from our end we do give solutions not just in terms of marketing like let's say engagement of patient support but we do it for regulatory clinical affairs medical affairs and we see that everyone is asking for these solutions because the need of the hour for everyone is to work efficiently right they all want to work efficiently so everyone is really in need of these solutions and they are actually accepting of them i mean from an internal company perspective maybe vibha or dirish or dr parab could speak about it but this is the flavor that i get when i speak to our clients yeah so thank you yeah, shweta okay one here. last sorry yes dirish please please continue so i would like to actually add to shweta's comment that absolutely you know this is what is happening in dr reddy's also uh, so 3 years back uh, you know we were we were actually trying to find business opportunities and uh, business uh, use cases and problems to solve with digital technologies and we would go with uh, to the business uh, teams and you know try to beg or you know kuch project de do hame uh, mm -hmm. but now actually teams are coming to us and then of late it has become so much that you know we are now trying to democratize everything design thinking and digital technologies has now become Uh, uh you know uh, uh, a very regular capability building initiative at an organization level because uh, alone and being in the digital coe we cannot actually you know help uh, each and every team to uh, come on to the digital brand bandwagon and we are now trying to build you know those capabilities within the teams also so that they can continue with it yeah thank you thank you dheeraj one last question and then i close it's from gagan uh, deepak he's an open question again to the panel what percentage of pharma companies will revert to old way of doing business once this crisis passes over so any take on this yeah that's a good question <laughs> uh i think 
it's it's time to be hyper uh, customer focused as follow the customer i think how our doctors and patients would behave I, even after the crisis is right it, we 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 would, we would follow i think and i think uh, as uh, dr parav was also mentioning right there are there are changes in paradigms which we have we have seen uh, uh, you know remote sp- office spaces coming in uh, remote diagnosis coming in from a patient perspective or a doctor who's sitting in a, at home trying to you know uh, take the call that are are the, the pandemic has shifted we were toying with this idea but we were forced into this uh, implementation of this uh, with with the pandemic setting in so i think we have seen what uh, uh, what 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 the older ways of working were and the efficiencies or dis- inefficiencies of that and we've seen this pandemic age as well i think it will be hybrid model we'll, but we as i mentioned will be hyper focused on the customer and follow the customer i think that's the only way uh, we will move yeah okay so any else anybody on this okay so uh on this closing note we actually had great insights from our experts today on how to adapt and succeed you know in this changing landscape uh, pharmaceutical companies are responding by digitizing and improving process with the help of technology so on this closing note uh, i thank our partner indigen for being here sharing their great solutions related to the pharma industries all our thought leaders for taking out your precious time being here and sharing great strategic insights on you know the pharma tech talks not missing a lovely audience for keeping these speakers and everyone engaged by putting up your questions on the chat boxes and asking your questions so uh, i hope everybody had a great session interacting here and we shall be updating uh, the video on the youtube link and sharing with every one of you plus my team will also share a feedback form we have also pasted that on the chat box you know so it would be really helpful to us if you can share your feedback form which also mentions you know about a brainstorm session with indigen so anybody who is interested to know more about solutions from the indigen we'd be really glad to connect you on one on one basis so uh, stay connected with us and uh, follow us on linkedin instagram facebook and twitter for the various webinars and various events so thank you everyone for your time stay safe and have a nice weekend everyone thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you, thank you everyone bye yes.